an honest performance. Centauri was the flagship of the Tessan Navy, named in the honour of the council that had founded their great nation. Growing it from the small provinces it had once been bullied and intimidated by all its neighbours into the most powerful country of the continent, with formidable armies, scientists and its pride, the navy. Sat upon the deck of the Centauri was Queen Oliantha, the first Tessan queen in her own right. She had led a brilliant military campaign to overthrow her incompetent brother. She commanded respect at every level of society and terrified any of the disobedient into compliance. She had rewritten the constitution and ascended to the throne. Other nations had mistakenly thought the woman would be incompetent and thus making Tessa a vulnerable target. She had quickly taught them how in error they were. Any rivals of Oliantha who did not fear her were already dead, and she knew that she had saved her nation from the potentially disastrous ruin of her brother, a man interested in food and fornication and little else. He was a fool who would have brought nothing but disaster. As she adjusted herself in the grand chair, she let a small smile cross her lips. She felt a warmth at remembering how all the barons had bowed to her. The satisfaction, over a decade later, was still so vivid. She took a sip of her wine and took a deep breath of the fresh, salty air. The sun shone down so brightly and the soft cadence of the waves eased her body. She had led armies on land and displayed her prowess with the blade many times, but it was here on the open seas, that she felt most alive, most at home. They had come out far enough that the seagulls had fallen back and returned to land, but the seas had stayed calm and welcoming, setting just the right stage for the Battle of Asile celebrations. Her people would have the annual commemoration. They would hear the tales of it and the tradition would continue. It was not particularly to her taste, but she would not deny her people the things they'd held dear. What was a nation without the contentment of its people? Nothing but a criminal enterprise where its leaders would grow fat on the marrow of peasants. There would be fireworks tonight. The skies would be lit and those on the distant shore would marvel at their beauty. They would be spoken of across all the lands. Varsal had happened over 200 years ago, but it never hurt to remind Arbinia who was in charge ever since. The main deck would soon be overtaken with tables for her guests. Banners would be hoisted and the sails lowered. Music would fill their ears and the atmosphere would be brimming with energy. The most glorious of foods by the finest of cooks would be laid out before them, and Oliante would indulge one of her numerous appetites. To either side of her sat her advisers, Verpless and Vertarkin, both men of great knowledge and wisdom, also utterly devoid of humour and vibrancy. They dealt in details and plots, not song and revelry. She longed for better company, like that of the man who had returned once more to entertain them, Nevin Kyle. First and foremost, a fool, a joker, a jester, but also a wit and singer, a man of joy. He was beloved across Tessa, second only to the queen, the people would say. Fortunately, she was not a ruler prone to jealousy, and his head had not been liberated. Instead, he was obliged to come here every year and be her entertainment. It had been a year or two before she had realised that he actually enjoyed coming here. The fireworks were a particular delight. Any explosion not intended to kill me is rather fun to see, he had insisted. And I'm not worried about you killing me, because we aren't even related. She had let him make the joke, and hadn't been sure why. She had laughed, even. It was such a strange and confusing feeling. Now Carl was playing the lute whilst doing acrobatics. He'd have to go through this whole routine again at night, but she enjoyed watching him. He didn't seem weighed down by anything at all. When he finished, rosy-cheeked and sweating, the Queen expressed her approval with a round of light clapping, to which everyone joined in, even the rather frightening guards who flanked the stage, their fearsome axes tucked under their arms for the briefest of moments. Oleanthus stood, as did everyone else, and she thanked the fool for his performance. You are most welcome, Your Highness, and he took a knee before her, observing proper protocol. Oh, for goodness sake, get up, Carl. He sprung up whilst the applause from the others began to peter out. Now I need to discuss tonight's celebrations with you. He smiled in an innocent and welcoming manner. But of course! She signalled to the band to commence music, and signalled for more food to be sent around. She would have them distracted and consumed with their own business. Follow me, she instructed, and he doffed his hat to her. The guards flanked her as they disappeared into a cabin at the prow of the ship. 
It was luxurious to the point of decadent, with fine furs and gold, elaborate furnishings and paintings. No longer a vessel of war, it was more a pleasure cruiser. I never ceased to be amazed at this place. Carl gleefully said as he wandered around the space. Wait outside, she instructed to the guards, and they replied without hesitation. Oh, thank goodness they're gone. They always give me the creeps. He shuddered. Only Ante looked at him with a smile on her face. You're always such a cheeky bugger, aren't you? True, he called out, and they both wrapped their arms around each other, sharing the warmest of hugs. How the hell have you been, my dearest? Good, good, she replied. And you? She gave him a little peck on the cheek, and they separated. Oh, me, I've mostly been entertaining at the homes of banal rich people and selling out to record crowds. Seems like people actually like me. Really? That is hard to imagine. Oliantha replied, spying a fresh platter of strawberries. I thought I told the jokes. She raised an eyebrow. Who said I was joking? Ouch. He called out and grasped his stomach as though he'd been shot by an arrow. Apart from wounding the egos of delightful performers, what else have you actually been up to recently? He perched himself on a large chair that made even his frame seem diminutive. I've mostly been running a country. Seems as though that's expected of a monarch. Two strawberries had already succumbed to her hunger. A third was about to meet its doom. And I have also been attempting to learn the loot. Really? Carl seemed surprised and that amused Oliante. Really? Twice a week for almost a year now. And how's that been going? Well, I still have to hire some silly bugger to play the loot at events like this, so... She let out a laugh and he chuckled along with her. By God, he loved the sound of that laugh. He'd only get to enjoy it once a year, but he'd be damned if it wasn't worth the wait. Here was the fierce warrior queen, the tigress of Tessa, enjoying a bit of banter in a private cabin. If someone had told him several years ago that this would happen, he'd have mocked them and not believed a word. But here he was. It was unbelievable. Women had never had much time for him, even with his growing fame. There was never much interest. He always tried to let it roll off his back, but it had always cut him. But... Sat across from this woman, all those years of rejection didn't seem so important. Oliante scratched the scar above her right eye, a habit of when she was nervous, and sat down on the bed. For propriety of importance to her, this would not be permitted. As it was, she didn't care. She wanted to hear about the travels and adventures of this fascinating man. Each year he would sit and vividly recall all his encounters, shows, humiliations and adventures. The time would flow like water, pouring out of the jug so quickly. She would laugh and cry with him, and then the clocks would announce that it was time for the show. The people needed their queen. They talked away the hours until very little time was left, and nerves were swelling up in Carl's stomach. He would normally deal with feelings through a joke or a song, but he knew better than to use such tricks with such a sharp woman. He had a question and needed to ask it. Why did you reject me? The question came out of the blue and the queen had not been expecting it. She sat there, puzzled, slightly taken aback. Pardon? You must recall, two years hence we spoke until the crack of dawn, and as day broke, I offered myself to you. Why are you bringing this up now? She was genuinely confused and anxious at the question. The usually jovial Carl now sounded so broken. Was, was, it, was it my work, or my class, or... It was neither of those things, I promise you. I'm not a shadow woman, and I do not allow society to dictate rules to me. Aliante was dead serious. Her voice had become somewhat stern. Can I ask why? I do not wish to cause disquiet in your heart, but I merely ask for some honesty. But I do not wish to hurt you. She touched his hand, and a sad smile was on his face. And, he said, with that, I have my answer. Only one truth would really hurt me, that you do not love me. He held back the tears that so readily wanted to flow. You are a wonderful musician, a beloved comedian, an athlete, and... It's all right, my queen, I understand. And I thank you for your honesty. He tried to force a smile on his face. You cannot force a person to love, and I would never try to visit such cruelty upon you. You don't love me, and that is it. But I wish I did. And he believed her, he truly did. 
She could not understand why her heart did not beat faster for him, why someone who brought such humour to her could not be the one she dreamt of. I'm sorry. She never said sorry to anyone. It's all right. He stood and gave her a hug. I have a performance to give. As he neared the door, he turned around. I shall see you next year, my queen. And he was gone. Olianthe slid the crown from her head and looked at it grimly. A great warrior and tactician, a respected diplomat, an intellectual and queen. Yet none of that protected her from the guilt she felt when she gazed at such a broken heart. But she could not lie as to what was inside her chest, and where that love should be, she found nothing.